tonight, CBS proudly presents The Homecoming, a Christmas story by Earl Hamner, Jr., a warm and inspiring all-family movie made especially for television. Starring Patricia Neal. The story of a family and a Christmas Eve that changed their lives forever. Happy holidays and welcome to Book Versus Movie. This is a podcast where we read books that have been adapted into movies, and then we try to decide which we like better, the book or the movie. I am Margot P. of ColoniaBook.com, and this is my good friend and co-host, Margot D. of Brooklyn Fit Chick. Hi, everyone. We are recording this on Christmas Eve 2020. Yep. My In the morning, I should say, and I have my I have a lovely hot beverage. No alcohol just yet, maybe, maybe later, uh, but... <laughs> But for those of you who may be new to us, you know, we, we as I said a moment ago, we read books that have been adapted into movies. But during this, well, the bulk of this last year, let's face it, we have been trying to do a new episode every single week for y'all. And so that means sometimes we're choosing things that are, we're kind of broadening the scope of literary sources. So we're doing some short stories, novellas, magazine articles. Um, today's literary source is, is a pretty quick read. We will get to it in just a moment, but we welcome you to this podcast, and we want, we want you to know there's a few places where you can interact with us and other listeners on the internet. We have a basic Facebook page where we post all of the episodes, but we're more interactive in our Facebook group. If you're sort of weary of Facebook, trust us, our Facebook group is really nice. We just talk about books and movies there. It's a good place to hang out, and it's a great place to leave us suggestions because we're putting out a new show each week, so we need the ideas coming up. What you do is you just type in, excuse me, VS Movie Podcast Group, and you ask to join, and we will let you in. Hang out there. We, you can also find us on Twitter at Book versus a movie you just spell that out we are on instagram at book versus movie you can send us messages there and ideas there and we have an old-fashioned email book versus movie podcast at gmail.com you can send us ideas suggestions there as well or if you would like some stickers let us know we'll drop some stickers in the mail for you we will and if you really like the show and want to help keep it going you can become one of our patreon patrons Yes. So I want to say thank you very much to Allison A. She just became a Patreon member. What you do is you go to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and you look up book versus movie podcast. We have a $1, $3, and $5 options. We've been doing this for six years. We have almost 70 episodes there. Some of them are books and movies. You're like, ooh, did they ever do Jaws? Did they ever do Jurassic Park or The Godfather? Yes, they're all behind the Patreon wall. You can either support us at the $1 level, and that just gets the lights going and stuff. At the $3 and $5 level, you can listen to all those episodes. Plus, there's a bunch of episodes there that are free if you just want to check it out for yourself. So thank you, Allison, so much for doing that. And wherever you get your podcast, be sure to subscribe. You'll never miss an episode. And if you leave us a five-star review on iTunes, we'll mention you on the air as well. Yes, we will. And actually, today's book and movie was a fairly recent listener suggestion. We are going to be talking about the movie, the made-for-TV movie. So again, we know we're kind of branching out a little bit. Oh, I should say also, if you're new, usually every December we do holiday movies for the entire month. So we last uh, week we did Little Women, and today we are doing the listener-suggested movie. A is it a Homecoming or the Homecoming? The Homecoming. The Homecoming. A Christmas Story. Earl, yes, that's right. Thank you. The Homecoming, A Christmas Story by Earl Henry Hamner Jr., a uh, movie, which we'll talk about in a moment, which uh, launched a cultural juggernaut mm -hmm. that people of, of uh, Margo and, and my <laughs> age um, could not escape, <laughs> I think we can safely say. Yeah, it was The Waltons, and that was a TV show about a Depression-era family in the 1930s in the mountains of Virginia, the Blue Ridge Mountains. 
this happened in the 70s. People really were into it. I don't know if because of the way the world was at the time. The 60s were very violent and very scary. And the 70s were kind of its own, will always be just sort of its own weird thing. But it was, we, yeah. we didn't watch it in my house. Okay. No, our, neither did we. No, my mom's like, my mom has people that are from, you know, she's like, no, I'm not watching that. But you couldn't escape <laughs> it. I mean, people who said, good night, John Boy, all the time. Like, that oh, was a joke. Everybody knew. Yeah. And I, like, again, we didn't watch the show in our house. I love that your mom was like, too soon. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, but we didn't watch it in my house either. And yet, I certainly, I know as a child, I certainly knew who John Boy was. I knew what that reference was was about because you said, I mean, there were, there were Walton's lunchboxes and I mean, it was such a phenomenon. And I think we've discussed this before when we've covered other things from the 70s. The 70s was a lot, there was like so many nostalgia movements that happened in the 1970s. There was definitely like a, this, you know, depression era and also the early 1940s nostalgia, you know, with like your mommy dearests kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, or, or Xanadu, if you've ever seen Xanadu is very much about that. Although I think that's like 19, early 1980s. Anyway. Well, the, ha well, happy days is a big example. Yes. Happy days. Oh my goodness. Which was about the fifties. And then there was also little house on the prairie. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of, and in fashion, it was very weird. There was a very much a jumble of all these different nostalgia movements that was going on. And this show was such a huge show. First of all, as we'll talk, we'll discuss in a moment, there was a lot of, I don't know why now in retrospect, it makes no sense to me, but, but for some reason there was a tremendous movement to make television more wholesome. Yes. And so there were many, many, uh, in the seventies, we have a lot of things which you don't have today, which is many shows about enormous families and also a lot of variety shows. Yeah. Oh, there were so many variety shows and all the family shows. There was all a lot of crossovers where all the family show people, which, you know, like all the, the, uh, the Brady bunch would mm -hmm. have a variety hour, but, but it, there were just all these shows about huge families and then all these shows about nostalgia. And then also these variety shows. It was a very weird time in popular entertainment. <laughs> it was still we... like, it was, it was well but... into the TV age, but it wasn't the cable era yet. Most people, right. you had like maybe one big TV in your living room and maybe a smaller TV. Like for us, it was you kept it in the kitchen or you put on a roller. If you were sick, you were lucky to get the TV in your room and you could watch TV in your room. But mostly like if you're watching TV, you watched it as a family. And so there, there was this thing. I think it was in Congress even enacted it. Like between eight I believe and ten, so. it was family yeah. time, and so you couldn't put anything. That's when at nighttime soap operas. Well, more in the eighties, but you know, at like ten o'clock at night was when you could get a little bit racier. But at like seven, eight o'clock, and especially Sunday nights, but it was sacrosanct. It had to be a family show. It had to be about families. Be learning lessons and being good to each other and it's it's this show was sort of like I guess you know the inflation rate of the 70s and there's all this uncertainty left over That's from true. the 60s yes the Vietnam War every yeah. all these things sort of came together and people were like I just wanted and I was watching this movie and if, I've watched it twice the first time I was like I'm a little bored sometimes and the second time I was like oh I kind of get it it's just very comforting. yeah <laughs> it's very yeah quiet. And yeah, now that you're saying that, it's kind of reminding me too of when, what year is that? Hold on, let me look. It's very much, there were some other films of that era. You know, you had starting, you know, early on with like Bonnie and Clyde, there was a lot of depression era stuff. Yeah. And then, you know, right at the end of the 70s, where you have Coal Miner's Daughter. So there was, yeah, I think you're right that there was a, there was a financial, it's hard to imagine in the United States that there was yet another period after the Great Depression where there was financial hardship. Um, but try, use your imagination. Mm -hmm. But there was like, it was something that at least for some generations hadn't been seen. And so people were freaking out with, you know, the unemployment rate and the inflation rate and having to wait in line, the gas lines were just mm -hmm. ludicrous, miles long, people waiting. And everybody had these giant boats of cars that, you know, gas guzzlers, Yep, yes. you got like nine miles to the gallon or something. And, and, you know, they would have these lines, you know, two mile lines to get gas. And so people were kind of thinking back to, well, how did the people in the, our grandparents in the depression survive this? And so, yeah, this is, so Earl Hamner writes this story. Now, Earl, let's talk a little bit about Earl Hamner because he's, He's a very interesting 
figure. Yeah, you wouldn't, you would hear this person's life and would never expect where he wound up. He grew up in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, uh, the oldest child of a large family. He uh, served in World War II. He was there right after Storm to the Beaches of Normandy. He was there. They found out he was a good writer, so he started writing for the Army there, came back to America. He's written several novels in his time. One of them was The Spencers. What is, what is it called? Sorry. Spencer's Mountain. Spencer's Mountain. So that's a story mm-hmm. that's loosely based on his life, and they filmed it in Wyoming, and it starred Henry Fonda and who else? I'm well, they did make a movie out of it. So his name is Hamner, and yes. he grew up in this big family in the, you know, the, it was a mining town in the Blue Ridge Mountains that went bust during the Depression, and then the family had to do, you know, do all kinds of things to scrape by. In the novelization of his life, so his name is Hamner. Mm-hmm. In the novels, the family is called the Spencers, but then the TV show is the Waltons, but and- it's basically all the same family's story. Exactly. So what I wanted to say, so in, in real life, his father worked for a soap mining factory. The factory went bust. And so the father could only get a job 30 miles away. And he would go every week. He would work all week. And then he would take a bus home and then walk six miles over the weekends to visit with his family. That was based on Earl Hamner's childhood. Ugh. And that's just what people did back then. I know. You know, they're made of sterner yeah. stuff. They were, yeah, they were tough. I mean, I was thinking about it and reading, the, and, I, and I, there was something like that in Coal Miner's Daughter, too, that at some point her father, I seem to remember that her father worked, like, really far away. Mm-hmm. But, like, you imagine, yeah, you first of all, it's not like he was sitting at a desk all day. No. Right? He's doing hard physical yeah. labor all day that he, first of all, he walked six miles to go there, which is fine. But, you know, but then a full day is a very difficult physical labor and a longer work day than, you know, most people have now. And then walking six miles back home after that. I mean, you probably just ate and fell asleep. Yeah. I don't know how they ended up with all those kids. I mean, wow, when did he have time to make kids? Because- well, we'll, t- we'll talk about the kids in a second. <laughs> That's going to be a thing. But, but I mean, it's yeah. just... Oh, my goodness. It sounds so hard. It's I mean, my great grandmother, her husband died and her sons were at were serving in World War Two. And she had this job for the phone company where she would take the elevated trains in Brooklyn. They used to be all elevated. And it was, you know, hundreds of feet, like 200 feet up in the air, all those steps in her with her bad back and her bad feet up and down those stairs every day and she was on her feet all day i mean just people like i said they were made of sterner stuff back then because they had to be but that was what he grew up with that's what he was talking about and he turned out he was pretty good at writing he went to northwestern then he went to university of cincinnati and he was writing all kinds of things he even said like i could write a matchbook cover if you wanted me to he just loved writing mm-hmm. so much he wrote a few scripts for the twilight zone he sold some of those scripts there's one that's called the witching pool or the bewitching pool which is one about the kids that dive into the pool and they escape their parents who are fighting all the time it's one of my favorite twilight zone episodes <laughs> they're all available by the way on audible there's a bunch of audible twilight zone episodes so you can get his on there on audible we'll talk about audible later but he wrote that then he wrote spencer's mountain based on his life about and so we had henry fonda was the star and it did pretty well and it was also early 60s very wholesome and then 1970 he turns that tale into the homecoming they had to change it to the waltons for the tv series but in the book it's the spencers it's clay spencer and then clay boy is his son yes Clay and Clay. Oh, it's Maureen O'Hara. Thank you. I was going to lose my mind. Uh, I have it in the show notes, by the way, guys. Sorry. (laughs) I have it in the show notes, too. So just just do that. Just to be clear, it's Henry Fonda and Maureen O'Hara in Spencer's Mountain, written by Earl Hamner, which is about the same family. Right. Hamner had a very six. So he writes this one that we're talking about today, The Homecoming. And it's a huge hit. It's it's on TV December 18th, 1971. People loved it. By the next year, it was a TV series, and it started this this company called Lorimar. It was one of their first productions, and he said CBS mm-hmm. didn't even care. They were just like, well, just see what you can do with it, see what happens. Because they had a right. bunch of hit shows at the time, like Mary Tyler Moore show and, and mm-hmm. All in the Family. So they were like, okay, you do your little Depression Era thing, and we'll see if it it, they, it does well. They, it does so well. It was nominated for multiple Emmys its first year. And it started, it's a family of gingers, of redheads. 
in the Depression era and how they just managed to get through life. And then Earl is the person he introduced all the episodes. He did the voiceover, the narration. Yeah, so that's a, a, another thing. So that was one of the kind of uh, tropes of the the Walton's TV series was that it would have – it always started and ended with this narration of the – very much like – the, the fellow who wrote A Christmas Story. Yes, I know who you're talking about. Just like Earl, one of the things that he has in common with Earl Hamner, apart from the fact that they both wrote these really you know, iconic Americana Christmas novellas, if you will, they both also possess not only great writing skills, but really terrific radio voices. I should have mentioned that Earl Hamner. It's a great voice. Oh, it's beautiful. And he had a radio background, too. He was in radio before he started writing for television. And so he had that kind of training. But And he's very handsome. If you look at him, He's he's. if you see pictures of him at that time, he yeah, was, he was really good looking. Yep. Married, had two kids, seemed like the nicest person in the world. He'd be like one of those rare people in Hollywood, like you'd never hear a bad word about him. He loved the Waltons. He he, t- he that was his baby the Wallens was on the air for almost 10 years those kids yeah. grew up John Boy went to college they got married Barry became a nurse I mean there was a whole thing the youngest daughter she had a poltergeist in her room I remember that episode I super loved <laughs> that was true <laughs> that's a late 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 episode by the way for the show but that's when that, so funny. isn't that hilarious? Yeah. But I could, that's the thing I remember the most about the Waltons. I think it was one of the only episodes I've seen at the time. He then went on to co-create Falcon Crest, which is a nighttime soap from Margot's and I's young era in the early oh. 80s. It was a big deal. I feel that Falcon Crest has been woefully overlooked yes. by history. When we look at the at the glamorous... Aaron Spelling-esque nighttime soaps of the 1980s. You know, we always talk about Dallas and Dynasty, but Falcon Crest, you know what about Falcon Crest? Here's what about Falcon Crest. The writing. Yeah. Better writing. I'm going to say it. Yep. There it is. I said it. Yeah. It's it's better It's a better quality of script that you're, than you're going to find in some of your other nighttime soaps. Fight me. Remember Hotel? <laughs> I loved Hotel. That took place in San Francisco. Yeah. yeah. Tiny Stelica. Yeah. Anyway. Yes. <laughs> he okay. wrote Falcon Crest. Yes. <laughs> like the polar opposite of the Waltons. Well, he goes from the Twilight Zone to the Waltons to Falcon Crest. Explain this to me. I don't know. Yeah. It, you would never get this from his background <laughs> and his life, the way he led his oh, life. so funny. Yeah. He's a, he lived to 92. Long, long life. And yeah. And so this is the movie that we're talking about today, The Homecoming. It's John Boy. And it's the in the book. Well, let's talk about just the basic story in the book. So it's Clay yeah, Boy. Clayboy. There's some differences between the book and the movie. I just want to say just right off the bat that I, I was very impressed by this book. I think I think it's a great story. And I think one of the things, well, there's a, we'll get into it a little bit, but, but just in general, kind of as a general note, I really loved some of the scenes and there's just no way you could film them, but there's some scenes in the book that are not in the movie that I think are, are so well written. And, and I just... I think he I I love the way that he and this is just a great screenwriter that he inhabits each of the characters. But yes, they're again they're the Spencer family in the book. I don't know if we're assuming that people have read Spencer's Mountain when you read uh, The Homecoming, but I think he does a good job of, of kind of giving you the backstory without going too far into it. Yes, it's sort of an extension of what he wrote about before, except he's sticking to just one story, and it was just this one night, and I believe it's 1933 when it takes place. The Spencer family, they're poor, but they're very loving towards one another, and they're you know, kind of the pull yourself by your bootstraps kind of people. And the father is out. Clay Sr. is works for his job and is coming home for Christmas. And so he has to walk a certain distance. From, and then it's a train and a walk and all that stuff. And he's not home yet. And so his wife is getting Olivia is worried about him, obviously, for good reason, because, yeah, you know, she got all them kids, all them damn kids. She's got his parents living with her. It's a small town. People talk about each other. And she's very proud. She makes a big deal about how they do not accept charity. That is something they don't have credit and they don't take charity. They just live with what they have. And that's the the lesson that they're imparting on their kids, which is not a bad lesson because of what happened with credit in this country and people living beyond their means. But 
she's tough. She's tough and she's very beautiful as she's described and she really loves her kids and the and Quay, Clayboy does he want to be a writer in this too? He, he Yes, yeah. He does. And he feels very like secretive and furtive about it because he's he idolizes his father and feels that he should he the boy should have ambitions to, you know, be a be a real hands-on you know, kind of laborer like his dad and that that is the honorable sort of profession. And yet he can't kind of turn his brain off. And he, mm-hmm. so he locks himself up in his room to, to write, to kind of use his, his composition books for school to, to write. And he's, yeah, he's super, super furtive about it. And, and which I think is great. I think I, again, I really loved, I thought the way that he wrote each of the children, but, you know, of course, especially Clayboy, cause he's the main character who goes on this adventure that we'll talk about. But uh, I really loved the way that he describes the psyche of this, of this kid. I thought, I thought was really beautiful. But as Margot said, she has a bunch of kids. One of them's named Patty cake. And oh yeah, (laughs) (laughs) but at some point she's really nervous about what's going on with the, with her husband. So she sends John boy out to get the father. And then there's sort of these adventures that happen. And then the father comes home. And the lesson is that, there's no place like home. You always want to be with your family. That's the best gift you can have, that kind of thing. And that's the way it ends. It's, it's, yeah, it sounds syrupy, but it's actually not. I mean, these people go through a lot. No, yeah, indeed. And I love like in the foreword, Earl Hamner, you know, basically he's taking an actual event that happened when he was a boy. He said, and, and embellishing on it, you know, so there was a, there was a, I think it was even a Christmas Eve that his father was super home, super late coming home and everybody was really worried and, mm-hmm. and they might even have sent him to go find him. But there are some really, really, yeah, scary scenes. There's, first of all, there's the character of Charlie Sneed. I love the friend of the dad mm-hmm. that comes by with the turkey. In the book, he has shot the turkey, which is illegal because it's out of it's not turkey season. But he has shot this turkey to to take it to the to the Waltons, knowing again that they don't uh, accept charity, but that you know that fact that he kind of had come by this turkey in the sort of shady means somehow mm-hmm. they're able to accept it. But there's the scene where John Boy is a John Boy Clay Boy is sent to cut down the family Christmas tree. And this is not in the movie. Yeah, in the movie, when he goes to cut down the tree, it, he cuts down this tree that's like two stories tall. Yeah, but exactly. Book, I know. Like, what are you talking huge. about? I know. In the book, in the book, it's a, it's a you know, a reasonable sized tree that a 15 year old boy could cut down with a little handsaw. He's recalling as he's walking out to where the tree is, this story that his grandfather had told him that the grandfather, the people around there of that generation talk about that there was an albino deer that, right. that wandered around the area. And he didn't know if that was true or not. And I love that because where we live, where I live here in San Diego, I live in an area where there's tons of canyons and I live by an old, it's not the mission, but it was a, a kind of fortification that the Spanish built this is before this was part of the United States and everything. And anyway, it's up on this big hill and there was a white deer. Um, nobody knew, like, did it escape from the zoo? Where did this deer come from? Cause we don't have deer here in this part anyway. And there was, there was a white little white deer. And so some of the older people, when I was growing up, used to talk about seeing the white deer. So I, I really love that. Anyway, he's remembering that as he's walking out to the, to cut down the tree. And when he gets there, he sees a doe, a female deer, <laughs> not an albino deer, but a doe who is caught in a wood pile that Clayboy had made earlier in the year. He'd stacked some wood to keep it from flooding, I think. And and now that he sees that this poor deer is caught in the pile. And, and I love it because I love this scene for a lot of reasons, apart from the fact that it's scary, because he's, he has like a little existential crisis because he knows that the thing that is expected of him as a man in this culture in which he lives is that he should try to kill this deer and bring it home. Get venison, yeah. That's what he should do. But he doesn't have a gun on him. He doesn't have anything on him that can kill the deer. And he's so relieved that he is not in any way able to kill this deer. And so he resolves to free the deer. And he's trying to free the deer. And as he's doing that, this white, spoiler alert, this white (laughs) stag albino stag with red eyes comes up and is like, Oh, a deer who can't get away from me. And it's like aiming to kill Clayboy to get to the female basically. Right. And terrorizes him 
terrorize, like really is trying to kill this boy, <laughs> this deer. <laughs> and, and I mean, it's so scary. And he's like, climbs up the Christmas tree, the deer, like almost, almost gets him and, and destroys the Christmas tree in the process. And so once he escapes, then he, he has to go find another Christmas tree. Anyway, I, I just thought that was such a great scene. Yeah. It's so well written. But yeah. how could you possibly film something like that, especially then? Yeah, you could you could do it now. You could you, make it all digital, but you, yeah. you just couldn't do that then. So well, I mean, there was one more thing I wanted to talk about. It's, for the most part, it stays very close to the book. Oh, one thing is the book has one more kid, I think. I think in the in the movie and in the series, there's one they, there's there's two boys that they make it to one character um in the Waltons. Well, it's just, I mean, just the fact that they send this young boy out into winter with like nothing <laughs> to go find his dad who could be anywhere up to 30 miles away. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, no. <laughs> like, like, oh, you'll find him. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> I just thought, like, really? I guess so. I guess that's what we did then. But no, there was, there was something else, but it'll come to me, I'm sure, as we're talking about the, about the movie. But we have a trailer. You know, one more thing I want to say. Okay. Though. Yeah, there's one more thing I want to say about the Hamner family is I saw – I was up super early this morning. I had a really bad headache, and I, I, was, I was sitting there watching YouTube videos, and I found this – I'll be. it was very weird, but it was a video of the cast of the Waltons, quote-unquote, interviewing their real-life counterparts, the Hamner family. Uh -huh. So – and it was very weird because clearly <laughs> – it was extremely obvious that Earl Hamner had written all of the questions as well as all of the responses. So it was, it's very like the actors acted, asked the questions in a very natural way, but you could tell they've been written ahead of time. And then the family is like, yes, I really enjoyed watching you portray me. Sometimes it brought back memories of that simple time. It was like that. Um, but I noticed also that like the entire family has radio voices. You should put that clip in they the have, Facebook They are group. very gifted. Yeah, I will find it and put it on there for you guys because it's pretty funny. It's it's just bizarre. But it was interesting to see, you know, his his real brothers and sisters and his mother. He talks to his mother. And they go around the house, like the actual house that they grew up in, which is now a museum, I think. So very, very interesting life journey that Earl Hamner went on. And then... I mean, just even up to that point, and that's even before the Walton. And then the whole freaking Waltons happens, which nobody saw coming because this was just supposed to be a TV movie. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's play the trailer for The Homecoming. Return to the simple life on Walton's Mountain. Hey, Grandpa, we got some show we own Walton's Mountain. You can't own the mountain any more than you can own the ocean or a piece of the sky. You hold it in trust. As the family awaits a very special kind of homecoming. Daddy promised he'd be home early today and he's not here yet. Daddy, I'll get here. You know he'll get here. Where's John, Olivia? I've been expecting him by to do his Christmas shopping. Well, John's not home yet, I... It'll be long. John Walton would no more stay away from home on a Christmas Eve than fly to the moon. A story of wonder. Away in the manger, no care for his bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. And giving. But I did know that John wouldn't have a chance to do much hunting this Christmas, so I thought he'd appreciate a little meat on the table. <laughs> Charlie, I, I don't know how to thank you. On one of the longest days of their lives. Snow continues to hinder attempts to rescue two men trapped when a bus overturned on Route 29. The bus filled with passengers homeward bound for the holidays went off the road near Cokesville. All passengers except for the two trapped men have been removed. Daddy won't get home, will he? Not unless somebody goes after him. Join Richard Thomas as John Boy. Patricia Neal as Olivia and Andrew Duggan as John Walton in the movie that launched an award-winning television series, The Homecoming, A Christmas Story. The Homecoming stars Patricia Neal as Olivia Walton, and it was a few years after she had her stroke. She was married uh -huh. to Ruald Dahl. We talked about her when we talked about Breakfast at Tiffany's. 
he helped her. I love her. She's wonderful. And there's times when she's walking where she looks a little unsteady. And I, yeah. Yeah. I, cause she had, uh, to, she had yeah. to relearn everything. She had to relearn how to walk and talk and do everything. And they really wanted her for the TV series, but she, they just didn't think she'd be able to handle, you know, uh, that kind of a schedule. Um, Richard Thomas is John boy. She, I was gonna say she's so tough. You would just think that she was just this like completely overworked mm-hmm. mother of nine. You know, that's how it kind of comes off in the movie. But yes, you're right. She was she was still re- recovering from a massive stroke. I was going to say my favorite Patricia Neal, and I may have talked about this when we talked about Breakfast at Tiffany's, but I'm going to bring it up again in case people haven't seen it, is a face in the crowd. She's such a versatile actress. She is brilliant. That's one of my favorite movies. Oh, she's so good. She is. She is. And so she plays the matriarch here. Richard Thomas, they ch- had to change the family to Walton for legal reasons. John by Walton. Edgar Bergen is grandpa in this. Yeah. He was he a ventriloquist, right? In the He had a show in the 40s. On the radio. On the radio. He's Candace Bergeson's father. Candace Bergen's father, excuse me. Ellen Corby is Esther Walton. Dorothy Stickney is Emily Baldwin. Josephine Hutchinson is Mamie Baldwin. Those are the two Baldwin sisters. The, they're the bootleggers in there. In real life, they died like very close together. Bizarre. They weren't really sisters in real life. William Wyndham as Charlie Sneed. He's so wonderful. And I, oh, this made my heart. Cleavon Little as Hawthorne Dooley. Judy Norton is Mary Ellen Walton. She's very teenagery in this story. And Mary Beth McDonough as Aaron Walton. There's a, just a bunch of people here, but this is the core group. And I loved Grandma Walton the best because she was so cranky. And she did that on purpose because the actress thought, you know, everybody's so nice and sweet. Like, I'm just going to be a little bit salty. And that's her whole thing. I can understand why. I think it's a great choice that she would choose to be so cranky like that because you would be. First of all, it's cold. Yes. You're, you know, it's not like they, have, they, they don't have a lot of food. They don't have a lot of heat. Where on earth is, is my daughter's husband? And, uh, or are, are in the book, I'm a little confused in, if in the book and the movie, are they, I, th- I feel like in one, in one thing, they're her parents and in the other, they're yeah. his parents. Is so that right? I think in yeah. the book, it's her parents and in the movie, it's his parents because they make it, she makes a thing about like, she married him because he was so handsome. And then grandma says, all of my boys were good looking. Right. Yeah. So I love I thought that was a great choice. Edgar Bergen was so famous. Yeah. Uh, and, and he's great. I love him in this role. He was the other big name movie star. In, in the in this made for TV movie, and then of course you have all of those kids. Yes. Oh, we forgot, and the bootlegger sisters. I, th- I think you mentioned them. Yes, yeah, but the, all of these children who I think were largely unknown on television, although they all were working child actors. They all lived in Los Angeles, and they were all working child actors including Richard Thomas, who, although wasn't living on, he was a, more of a stage actor, but he'd been acting since he was a tiny kid. But anyway, yeah, it's a lot of kids. Yeah, it's a lot of kids. And Richard Thomas is great. I loved, I was checking his IMDb page. And if you look at it, they put their you know, biggest credits right by their name. And for him, it's the Waltons and then Stephen King's It, the TV movie. <laughs> It's like those two <laughs> images kind of juxtaposition next to each other, which is bananas. But he's so good. As John Boy, I mean, he's asked he's you a lot. He's good. Yeah. Yeah. He's 20 mm-hmm. um, when he made the, the, the homecoming. But he's, he, I mean, he's, he is, a, he is just, um, he's a very talented actor, which is why he's had such a very long career. But he does play that, you know, you get all of the, you know, he's, he's the, he's going through the conflict of wanting to be a writer and struggling to be like his dad. And um, like, I thought he acted like, this is a weird scene, but I thought that he did it very well. There's this scene where he's driving Charlie Sneed's truck Uh in the snow, in the dark. And he's hearing all the voices of the, the elders of his family, like telling him what kind of a man he should be. And he's struggling with that. And it's all like voiced over internal stuff. And it could have been like super cheesy. But I think, you know, with his 
just his facial reactions as he's thinking about this. I think it comes off actually really convincing. I well, there's also a whole thing. Patricia Neal is just a fantastic actress. I, they oh. they and she she uh, she won the Golden Globe and she was nominated for an Emmy. But there's a whole th- there's a running thing going on here a few times where she's like, Jamba, what are you doing in your room with a locked door? And I'm like. <laughs> He's a teenage like she boy. Knows. Yeah. She knows. But she she but just it, wants him to know that she knows it, how come he has <laughs> to lock the door. There's nothing there, there's we can do but sit and wait. Can't sit and wait, and wait one more minute. President Roosevelt and his family have gathered for the traditional Christmas Eve dinner. Later this evening, the president will leave. John Boy? John Boy? All up? Second mama, unlock this door. Are you smoking cigarettes up here? Oh, ma'am. Then what are you doing? Nothing, mama. Then what's the door locked for? Well, I reckon I just locked it without thinking. Are you hiding something in that bed, John Boy? Yes, ma'am. I'd like to know what you're hiding. A tablet? Why in the world would anybody want to hide a tablet? Mama, you know, I have a right to some kind of privacy in this house. I just don't understand you, John boy. Hiding things under a mattress? Is it something you're ashamed of? Oh, no, ma'am. Then why are you hiding it? It goes on and on and on. And you can see like Richard Thomas is getting like, really uncomfortable because she's like not letting him out of it. Like she's just really like, are you smoking cigarettes? No. Are you? No. <laughs> I'm sorry. That just cracked me up like each time. I just, I just me loved too. it. I yeah. loved it. And Charlie Sneed is so yeah, sweet I... with the turkeys. Oh, oh. He... What's his name? Um, William Winden. Oh, what is your name? Winden. William Wyndon, who, if like me, you love the series Murder, She Wrote. Yes. He played Dr. Seth Hazlitt. He lived in Cabot Cove. He was one of the people who lived. He was the doctor of Cabot Cove, (laughs) which is where Jessica Fletcher lives. And there was always this like, is he interested in her tension? Yes. That never went anywhere. But so, yes, that's the guy. that, And he's wonderful. And I think I saw an interview somewhere. So he, Robert Wyndham, and... The guy that plays the sheriff, yes, in the movie, and Earl uh, Earl Hamner, all from Virginia. Oh wow! So they, yeah, so they were. So that scene where it's it's the sheriff and Charlie Sneed, um, they were really like playing up the Virginia. They they have little things that they do, like weird little Virginia idiosyncrasies that they throw in there, because they were just really getting off on the whole Virginia thing. <laughs> Even though they're not filming in Virginia, we should say. Are they in Wyoming? They're in Wyoming for those outdoor shots. Uh, and, oh, my God, that when they're walking in the snow to the house, do you not feel how cold wow. that is? I was just like, ugh. <laughs> you know, and Mary Ellen's and in And they're not dress. wearing very No. Yes. Yeah, she's in a dress and stockings. Like, that's it. They don't have snow boots. They don't, they're not in layers. I mean, it's tough living. And so she... The father's not home. You keep waiting and waiting, waiting for him to come home. She's basically, she's got a f- few pennies to put towards sugar to make a cake for dinner. Like, that's how mm-hmm. how str- they're struggling, you know. And so it's great when Charlie shows up with the turkey, so she has something there. And, yeah, the, her mother-in-law gives him a hard time. Like, where'd you get this turkey? It looks store-bought. And turns out he had, like, a whole bunch of them in his back seat. He's just buying them for people to be a nice person. He's so sweet. no. No, no, no. He stole them. Oh, he's he the stole thief? them. Yes, he's the thief. Oh, okay. I missed that. Sorry, you guys. There's a whole thief 
subplot yes. going on here. Right. So in the book, it's a little different than the book. So in the book, he shot this turkey out of season to take to the Waltons. I mean, he gets arrested for hunting out of season. But in the movie, they, they set this thing up early on that there's somebody's going around and stealing food and giving it to the poor and nobody knows who it is. And that's why. So the sheriff catches Charlie Sneed with all of this stolen stuff in his back of his truck and um, and arrests him. Oh, OK. I missed that. Yeah, he stole it. That's why it was from a store, because that's where he stole it from. Yeah. And then and grandma knew she knew something was up. Yeah. Yeah. And then we have Cleavon Little, who plays Hawthorne Dooley. And he has uh, a little yeah. boy. And oh, they're so sweet. And he's working for the uh, Baldwin sisters and they're bootleggers. Yeah. And we're and and you know, Olivia does not like bootleggers. She doesn't like smoking and she doesn't <laughs> like bootleggers. And you meet the Walton sisters and I mean the Baldwin sisters and they seem like they're a hoot. They're they're really fun and they have like, you know, the nice house and everything. But so that's who he's working with to make some extra money. There's all these things mm-hmm. just just going on. And then um Mary Ellen, I believe is that that yeah, Mary Ellen Walton, Judy Norton. She's a teenager, she's a tween, she's going through a tough time. Oh, uh, yeah. I have to say that I was I, I was so impressed in the book and in the movie of how well Earl Hamner captures that awful time in a girl's yes. life. Like it's such a terrible, it's such a terrible st- stretch that we all have to live through. And I thought he really, you know, sympathetically yes. and accurately portrays it. And and I do think Judy, what's her name? Uh, Judy Norton. Judy Norton. I think she does a really good job too. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's a whole thing where there's a Baptist there. There's a uh, revival. There's a sort of a, uh, there's this woman giving out free toys to the kids and the mother doesn't want them to go. Cause she doesn't want that charity, but they want to see what's going on. And then the littlest one gets a toy and it's a doll, but it's like the ugliest piece of crap because it's just like a, you know, used doll. It's like, it's not a, and it scares her Mm -hmm. and they go home and they realize like not all charity is good. And they, that maybe that's just the lesson that they're supposed to get. But I get, you know, at the end, their father does come home, spoiler. And he, what, who is the actor that plays? Duggan. Um, what's your name? Oh, something Duggan. Andrew Um, Duggan. Sorry. Yes. He played Margaret's father on MASH. Margaret Houlihan's father. He he did a mm-hmm. lot of like 70s stuff. They everybody, the dye jobs are kind of the red hair dye jobs are sort of working sometimes. A little mm-hmm. yeah. He yeah. Sometimes they leave head. a bit to be desired. Yeah. He, he Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. But I he's thought. a good he would always play like if you needed a gruff yes. older gentleman who doesn't have time for sentimentality. Like that's who he would always play. He's really good though. He's really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He comes home and the kids are super psyched that he's home. And then that's like one of their best Christmases ever is because he made it home with through all of that. And so we just have all these stories. It's a simple American tale and it's not, it sounds sentimental. It's not, it's actually pretty, it's pretty gritty. And, I super enjoyed it. Yeah. I, I'm like, I, you know, I'm just really halfway, did too. I really, I mean, I'm halfway through watching it the second time. I'm, I'm liking it even more. And, and Chris in our Facebook group says he watches it every year with his family. I'm like, yeah, I get it. It's, it's really nice. Yeah. yeah. I had never seen it again. I, we didn't really watch the Waltons. We only would watch it sometimes if like, oh, it's what's on and we would watch it. But we right. weren't like devoted fans of the Waltons or anything in our house. So I certainly never had seen this movie. Oh, and we should say too. So the movie was just supposed to be a one-off. Yes. And I, I saw an interview with one of the boy actors. I can't remember which one, um, but one of the one of the boys who was in the movie and in, in the series, uh, when he got, he said when he got called for the audition for the movie, for the, the homecoming, he was saying to his mom, like, oh, wow, sometimes these movies get turned into series. Maybe this could be a whole series, like, for the next six years or something. And her mom was like, let's just get through this afternoon, shall we? You yes. <laughs> and then he said he got cast in the movie. And he, they were on the bus going out to Wyoming with everybody on the bus. And he was like, yeah, this is going to be a series. And everybody was like, um, we're just lucky to have this movie. Can you just? Yeah, slowly roll. Let's all just settle down about this. 
<laughs> and and that's absolutely what happened because the, the the network was under pressure to develop this kind of quote unquote family programming, and the movie had gotten such a good reception that they decided to turn it into a series, and it turned out to be a major hit for nearly a decade. But nobody but that one kid thought that that's what would happen when they made this movie. But, but I get it. Watching it now, I could I could totally see them going like, oh yeah, you know, we could people might want to see more of this family. It was fun. It was very popular. I don't know how to explain it. It just, it was, it was, it was popular before my time, you know, by the time I was old enough to mm-hmm. kind of pay attention to the TV and stuff like that. It had been around for a few years, but I was more into the sitcoms, yeah, you know, I wanted my happy days and work and Mindy and the, you know, Laverne and Shirley, yeah. but that was my jam. It was not like this would, I just don't have, I couldn't be able to sit still for something like this, but my grandmother really loved it. It's like grandparents really loved it yeah. or, you know, the people who lived through that generation. Yeah. yeah, it was, but like you said, there was this call for the time of having wholesome television for like 20 years or something people are like oh eight o'clock needs to be pure it's only for families but then now at your home like everybody has a screen everybody everybody can watch what they want yeah it's all different now sure but it was it was a massive massive hit and i i again it looking at it from now this movie i think is great i again with the everything about it i thought was so well done and again we talked about the I can't remember when we talked about this, but it was recently about made for TV. Oh, probably Elvis and me mm-hmm. made for TV movies were, it was different than it is today. Like it was like this really special event that would happen. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds so dumb, but it's true. So you had your normal TV and then like, especially during the holidays and stuff, there would be these made for TV movies that they would, they would sink a lot of money into these things. So I think that the, the art direction and the costumes and all that, I think is, is really, really well done and definitely better done in this movie than it was in like, say the later seasons of the Walton. Yes. For example, like they kind of got a little bit lazy and sloppy near the end and everybody just had seventies haircuts and we just and, didn't and poltergeist. think about it. But <laughs> poltergeist. I swear that's true. <laughs> oh my God. It's just so funny. There, um, there's a podcast I love. It's called Sam Pancake's Monday Afternoon Movie, and Sam Pancake is his real name. He's a character actor, and he just talks about cheesy TV movies from the 70s and 80s. Uh, And there there were were so many. many. I mean, there was like Saturday night was like a movie night for TV movies like that. And they did really well. And lots of horror movies. And like, you know, there's the one about uh, Mm -hmm. Lizzie Borden was really, really popular. I mean, there's. Oh, remember that with uh, with Montgomery. Yeah. 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 So he talks about stuff like that. And so but people did put money into them. Like Margot said, like if you didn't go out to the movies, you could watch one of them. This is before cable. Yeah, and we just had a few channels yeah. to choose from. So they got, you know, something yeah. like this and would get like 20 it, million to watch it and it wasn't a big deal. Oh, oh, easy. Easy. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The numbers, the numbers in those days were, were uh, ridiculous. But, you know, two, uh, talking about the kind of financial crunch of the 1970s, as silly as it sounds today, when a movie was like, what was it, like a dollar fifty? Yeah. Yeah. If. <laughs> to take your whole family to the movies was just not a thing that a lot of families would, would splurge on. And so, yeah, it was an event, you know, that you, you would watch with your whole family. And so I'm sure I can, I can absolutely now. So this, this aired. Yeah. I, I think it's before I was born that this movie aired, but mm-hmm. I can see how people would have just really responded to it. Just like with the Christmas story. It's great. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how I've managed to go this long without ever seeing it or hearing about it let alone reading it but he's he's a very good writer yeah great voice in the voiceover yes and i and um, it's well acted yeah yeah i was gonna say um what two things one um over the closing credits of this show i'll play a little bit of his narration if you've never heard it before so you it's just the start of the movie you can just hear how he sounds he has a wonderful voice and also that we got this idea because margo and i are going to do these events more often on our facebook group where we take questions from you and suggestions from you and we interact and it was somebody that was in the last group thing that we did that mentioned it yeah i had not heard of it yeah it, i really enjoyed it i really really enjoyed it i loved i mean i know you patricia neal i'm sure was not up to doing a nine year series no she uh so know. so that role you know no 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 so the parents were recast 
but I really loved the parent. I thought that, and, and this is just mainly because of her, because she's so great, but, but like the way she, I loved seeing the way that character, the mother character is with the children versus with the, I guess her in-laws mm-hmm. versus with her husband, when her husband finally comes home, you know, you get to see these different facets or like when she goes, she, she sends clay boy to go or John boy to go find the dad. And then she gets down and prays in his room. Mm-hmm. I, I just, just wonderful little moments. Oh, and with the, the Christmas cactus, when she brings Boy, out the Christmas cactus. I loved it. That's not in the book. In the book, the Christmas cactus, she has, has a Christmas cactus, but one of the children has broken the window and the Christmas cactus has died. <laughs> but in the movie, in the movie, she brings out this Christmas cactus and just the wonder of it. I have a Christmas cactus right now that is blooming. It doesn't look anywhere near as nice as um, as Mrs. Uh, Walton's. But I mean, just that it's, and you can imagine like the ice and the snow and to see something like that, how magical that must be. I, I loved it. I loved it, loved it. I thought she was so wonderful. Like she could be so serious, of course, in her voice, mm-hmm. so low and da, 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 da. And so she could have this very serious why'd you lock the door? Um, but then when she brings in the Christmas, like she has this childlike gleam in her eye when she's sharing this cactus with the family. I just loved it. I thought she was so wonderful in this movie. Yeah. She deserved it. She deserved the attention she got from it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So book versus movie. Oh, honestly, I have to say it's a tie. For me, there were some things in the book that I thought were so beautiful, like that whole thing, again, with the deer in the buck. And the, I thought that was such a, a powerful little kind of fable in the middle of the whole story and getting to see a little more of each character's inner life. I, I really loved I think I think it's a beautiful story, um, but I really loved this movie, too. I thought that that the move, the choices that they made for the movie again, were the, were the right choices. Um, and all kinds of fun stuff. Like when Cleavon Little is singing with the, yes. <laughs> with the Baldwin sisters in the, in the book, Hawthorne, that character, he just takes Clayboy in the book to the Baldwin sisters and drops them, drops him off there. He doesn't like come inside and have a whole party with them, but I love that he's there for that scene in the movie. I really enjoyed that. Well, that's Cleavon Little, too. He's just, I mean, R.I.P. He died way too young. He was yeah. very, very dynamic. He's, you know, have you ever seen Blazing Saddles? He's hilarious. He, he's, he's, he's a wonderful choice for this. It's, it's not as wholesome as this movie, by the way, if you've never seen Blazing Saddles. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but he's so good. Yeah. I mean, he was a very, he was another one who had a big stage career also. And yeah, I, the whole thing, I think it's just delightful. I love the sisters. I saw one of the cast members talk about how magical it was for them to see that Christmas tree that the sisters have. Like those are real candles. Mm-hmm. Those are real flames on that yeah. tree. The whole, I mean, just all, all the way around. I, I, I really did love it. But I think for me though, it is a bit of a tie. I think the source material is so good. I agree. What about I, you? I totally agree. I think it's absolutely, I, it's a tie for me. And I'm so glad that somebody, I think, you know, you and I are probably like, oh, I don't like the Waltons. I'm not a Waltons person. I'm not going to watch this. It's not going to yeah. be something I'm interested in. It's its own thing, you guys. Don't think about it that way. It's its, its own, yeah. it's, it's a standalone movie all on its own. And it's perfect just the way it is. I agree. I agree. I think, I, I again, I'm not, I wasn't like that. I didn't see enough of the Waltons to maybe make this statement that I'm going to make that's super judgy. But I always felt, even as a kid, that it was so, it got very sappy and yeah. preachy. And they were so good. These right. children were so well behaved. Um, but in this movie and in, in the book, they're so much more realistic. And they fight and they they don't understand each other. And yeah, they have inner and outer conflicts that I, are so re- realistic that, um, you know, it's a very realistic family to me in this book and in this movie. And I, I love that. Absolutely. Same here. So next week, is next week finally going to be 2021? It probably will be. Is that- yeah. Oh, I sure 
So yeah, so you guys, we're uh, we're, we're going to need a little extra time because we're going to be covering the Poseidon Adventure, which we're both super <laughs> excited about. So that's going to be the next book to movie. But honestly, please ask us for uh, please give us excuse me your suggestions for other things in all the social media places. And I forgot to mention with Audible, we do have a promotion with them. If you go to audibletrial.com forward slash book versus movie, you could try their service for free. There's some Earl Hamner Jr. scripts from the Twilight Zone there read by people like Karen Black and other people. I was like checking that out earlier. I'm like, oh, this is neat. This is something I might need to check out. And uh, Margo, where can they find you? You can find me on the internet at coloniabook.com and all of my social media callouts are at She's Nacho Mama. And where can they find you? You can find me on social media at Brooklyn Fitchick, mostly for Twitter and Instagram. And my blog is brooklynfitchick.com. And guys, we'll be back in the new year with a new episode. Yay! Thank you so much for listening to the Book vs. Movie Podcast. We're a part of the Electronic Media Collective. And we follow the hashtags Potter and Family and Lady Pod Squad. You can find us on social media at Book vs. A Movie. You just spelled it all out for Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can send us an email at bookversusmoviepodcast at gmail.com. If you want to join our Facebook group, look for us under Book VS Movie Podcast Group in Facebook. Ask to join, and you may be lucky enough to get in. We also have a Patreon page if you want to support the show. Go to patreon.com and look for Book VS Movie Podcast. We record the show with our handy H6N, donated by those of you who are nice enough to contribute to the Patreon page. Thanks so much, and we'll be back soon with a new episode. My grandfather used to say that nobody owns a mountain, but getting born and living and dying in its shadow, we loved Walton's mountain and felt it was ours. Walton family had endured in that part of the Blue Ridge for over 200 years, a short time in the memory of the mountain. Still, our roots had grown deep in its earth. When I was growing up there with my brothers and sisters, I was certain that no one on earth had quite so good a life. I was 15 and growing at an alarming rate. Each morning I woke, convinced I had added another inch to my height while I slept. I was trying hard to fill my father's shoes that winter. We were in the middle of the depression, and the mill on which our village depended had closed. My father had found work in a town 50 miles away, and he could only be with us on weekends. On Christmas Eve, early in the afternoon, we had already started looking forward to his homecoming. I tell you, I don't know what's the matter with you. You think it's springtime or something? Next last time you're gonna get out of there and run up in the hill. You some kind of rabbit? Now move. Get off. Yeah, I'm gonna give you some of the best thing you ever cracked your kids on. Thank you so much for listening to the Book vs. Movie Podcast. We are a part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more podcasts you will love at frolic.media forward slash podcasts. We follow the hashtags Lady Pod Squad and Potter and Family. If you want to support the show, you can go to our Patreon page, go to P-A-T-R-E-O-N and look for Book versus Movie Podcasts. We have a basic Facebook page, but we also have a private Facebook group. Go to Facebook and type in Book vs. Movie Podcast group if you want to join that. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Book Versus Movie. Spell all those words out. If you'd like to send us an email, it's Book Versus Movie Podcast. Spell that all out at gmail.com. You can follow Margot D at Brooklyn Fit Chick on social media and Margot P at She's Nacho Mama. Thanks so much again for checking out our show, and we'll be back soon with a new episode.